Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Yash Manian. Yash is the perception lead at I Am Robotics. Yash, welcome to the pod. Hi, Spencer. Pleasure to be on this podcast. Good to have you on. Yeah, okay. it's, uh, I'm glad you uh, you took me up on the invite and uh, excited to have you here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I ran into you at the climbing gym. I didn't expect I was going to be in a, at a, on a podcast. At some I didn't even know we were going to go climbing again. <laughs> so it's yeah. happy to have made a new friend and... Uh, you know, it's it's amazing, like just before we get into anything to do with our work, like how many roboticists and like venture capitalists you see at the climbing gym? Oh, like, so many. I don't know it's, what it is about climbing that attracts like people in this discipline. I don't know if you have any ideas. I have that. a theory. I have a hypothesis at least. It's uh, that, um, sure. I mean, growing up, I was never into organized sports. So no cricket, no football, yeah, none same. of that. I imagine that's the same, like we're all nerds, so. Climbing's a very, it's like you're solving a puzzle with your body, basically. Yeah, that's true. So I imagine that appeals to people like us who like solving puzzles in general, so. Yep, I think that's probably it, yeah. And it's a good workout. It's a great workout. Yeah. I got in in high school, and like the reason my forearms are as big as they are is because I've just been climbing for, I don't know, like probably 20 years now. Yeah, <laughs> so. I, I started climbing thinking, oh man, I'm going to be ripped like all the climbers I see, and then only thing that happened was my forearms got bigger. So. And people are like, ah, oh, you're masturbating. <laughs> you're like, that's not how that works. <laughs> no, different muscle groups. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's not how that works at all. <laughs> but everyone loves to make that joke. <laughs> you bring it up. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, what are some of the things you work on as a perception engineer? So... Currently, I'm Robotics's main product is Bolt, which is well, it's the Agera system, which is a person-to-good system. The robot itself is an AMR, the autonomous, autonomous mobile robot. Exactly. So it needs to be able to drive around in relatively unstructured environments. It needs to be able to know what its surroundings are like, so it can avoid obstacles. Uh, so if I break that down, so my team basically works on the localization and mapping problem. We work on creating a belief of what's around the robot that the robot can react to. So, you know, you can detect and avoid collisions. Um, we work on fusing multiple sensor sources to create this belief. So uh, the robot has what? There's a 2D line scan LiDAR, it has two RGBD cameras, a bunch of other proprioceptive sensors, which kind of feed into that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, Proprioceptive meaning like seeing where its appendages are at. And, uh, pro proprioceptive meaning uh, it has uh, they measure the internal state of the robot. Okay. Like so, encoders measuring how far the wings yeah. have turned. So yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. So like right. an encoder me measuring like yeah. where it's at. I didn't think of an encoder on a wheel as being proprioceptive. I mean, technically, I know that term from the kinematics class I took. So yeah. it's typically used for robot arms as far as I, I know. It just, I heard it at a trade show with somebody talking to about sensors that measure the internal state and I never got it in grad school. So that's interesting. Yeah. It's, I think it can still be applied to AMRs, but they have significantly fewer degrees of freedom than... Does an IMU count as a proprioceptive sensor? I imagine it does. Okay, yeah. nice. Yeah. I'm sure someone, I, I, I don't know if someone in the comments is going to be, no, it doesn't because of these, these reasons. Send all hate mail to podcast yeah. at SKA.solutions. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know, it should count as a proprioceptive sensor. Yeah, so. that makes sense. Yeah. That's cool. What about, oh, so then by that logic, like a shunt or like a field effect sensor for measuring current utilization would also count? Yeah, I imagine it would. Yeah. So the way I see it is you have exteroceptive sensors, which are like cameras and LIDARs, which measure the state of stuff around you. Yep. And then what's interoceptive or proprioceptive would be what measures the state of the robot itself. And to really stitch together a belief of what's around you, you need both. Yeah, it makes sense. So um, I imagine, so a Hall effect sensor that actually Oh, no, you meant a current sensor, right? Yeah, yeah, well, you can use Hull Effect for current or motor position, I think, yeah. right? And so, I'm sure other stuff I don't know about you can also use it for. I, uh, I mean, uh, at some point, I've seen, for collision detection, I've seen the current sensors used on um, 
on a motor to basically determine the amount of back here. Oh, that's interesting. So the, instead yeah. of like a bumper like they used to do, yeah. you're just like, you know, my bumper is squishy enough. I'm not going to destroy it if I crash into something. It, it works better with, uh, if you have direct drive wheels, if you don't have a gearbox. That makes um, sense, because your dip. gearbox could be varying degrees of yeah. friction. I don't think that's a real word, but <laughs> friction, <laughs> different coefficients yeah. of friction. Wait, fact, I kinda like you have more of the direct up. feedback coming in from your wheel since there's no gearbox to between its interface to the world. It's directly in, in contact with the ground. So I think uh, I've seen that being used to detect collisions and worked pretty well. That's pretty awesome. Oh, that was like the big difference between like the um, early Rethink Robotics products, right? Like the Baxter and mm -hmm. like the UR products and the Sawyer was that they used you know, current sense to detect collisions as opposed to series elastic actuators, which kind of suck in practice. <laughs> in my personal opinion, I'm sorry if you like series elastic actuators. I mean, I've no seen offense to uses. people who've used Baxter. I mean, I'm not a fan of its actuators I either. I fucking hate Baxter. It wasn't exactly the most accurate robot arm. It, no, it would be like, you know, you'd be like, hey, go over here. And it'd be like, you mean here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that's six inches away, Baxter. It's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, so one of my graduate school projects was for a planning class. Uh, we had a machine learning class and we had a planning class and for the machine learning class we taught uh, this reinforcement learning network to play tic-tac-toe. Oh cool. It got so good nobody could beat it. I mean you could you would always battle it to a draw. <laughs> nobody could actually defeat it. Uh, in, I guess in reality it couldn't defeat us either so I guess it just rea re realized that I just don't have to lose. So over time over 200,000 games or something it would just kind of battle you to a draw. And then How you thought, did you get 200,000 games into it? Like, you found people with that much time on their hands? No, but... you, uh, it's a state action table, so you choose... Um, wait, I forget how we did that. But basically, we just ran 200,000 iterations of different games. Did you have it play, like, another AI just to be able to... Pretty play? much, okay. effectively. Uh, I don't remember how we did it. I, I do know I, don't, I don't know... I don't remember if we had some sort of deterministic way of saying, oh, these are all the possible combinations. Yeah, there's only, set, many, yeah there's yeah. only nine spots on the exactly. board. Exactly. There's only, uh, there's only, I forget, I forget the math on that. So there's nine spots and each one has three possible states. So nine cubed. Uh, I can't do math. So yeah. I've been drinking the ski with whiskey in it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. But basically, effectively, uh, you could get it to play against itself because there's not, a, not that many states. And eventually, its state action table would be its its reward function would basically tell it, you know what, just battle people to a draw. And we <laughs> thought, wouldn't it be cool if we actually got a Baxter to do it? Oh, so yeah. For a planning project. Uh, <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we actually had a physical tic tac toe. Um, we had a tic tac toe. Uh, what do you call it? A grid. Yeah. Yeah. We had a tic tac toe grid. And, grid. Uh, yeah. and then basically that was mapped to Baxter's coordinate frame. So we knew where each of the four posi uh, six, nine positions were. And then basically someone would go in and because we didn't, we wanted to originally incorporate the camera on Baxter, yeah. and segment out the grid and determine determine what someone has drawn, whether it's a circle or a square, uh, it's a circle or a cross, yep. or if it was blank. And uh, so that's how we would extract the state. But again, grad school projects and we don't have the time. So we actually manually entered the state of that specific cell. Yeah, makes sense. And then Baxter would, the the project was Baxter's arm would move to that specific, uh, you know, uh, grid Where it cell. needed to be and, and draw. Exactly. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the network we had would tell it what it needed. The state action table we had would tell it where it needed to place its end effector and what it needed to draw. And we just have it planned there and drop its uh, end effector so someone would go there and actually draw the uh, cross or zero, I forget what it is. But again, yeah. it became a pretty interesting thing. So it was in the, uh, I forget what it's called, the Robot Realization Lab at UMD. Yeah. And uh, it became a demo which we showed people who came in because it was so cool. Oh, it actually worked. You were it actually worked, draw. yeah. Yeah, we had to do some hacky things. So we had to basically restrict Baxter's uh, motion on its six degrees of freedom arm to a singular plane so we didn't end up in all these weird single singularities for the joint angles. That makes sense. Um, but it, it did end up working and it became a really cool demo that, you know, people just would come to the lab and that would be, oh, this is what the lab's That's all awesome. about. We tried to do my grad school project on a Baxter and then ended up moving to an ABB arm because we just couldn't get it to do... If I had access to an ABB arm, I would have done that too. Baxter's yeah. a terrible... 
<laughs> it's, it's terrible that it's it's the feet I, like the joint control it's almost as if it has rubber in them yeah well i think it's those springs right like if you yeah. look at the shoulder axis mm -hmm. it's got those springs presumably they've got potentiometers on them yeah and then i mean that's the series elastic bit but i mean it's i don't know it's, i don't know if it's just the tuning's a little soggy or like do they still make Baxter's? No, no, that company's been out of business. Heartland, Rethink Robotics for, for a while now. Oh, wait, Rethink shut down in 2018. I remember now. Yeah, yeah. And so they, they did the Sawyer. That was like their last ditch. You are kind I of crushed I remember Sawyer. I mean, Sawyer wasn't bad. It didn't need the screen, though. That was kind of like they're still trying to put googly eyes on it. Yeah, but I mean, we saw it at our lab. So the UR 10s came out and nobody was using Baxter after that. So Yeah, the UR has been an interesting. So, I mean, first of all, like, you know, we talk a lot of shit on Baxter, but I got to say, like, it did pave the way for, like, all the different cobots. Oh, like, yeah. It was the first one of, of many robots that are coming into pretty common utilization today. And I, I've been to factories where you can see URs in use. And, I mean, the price point they've managed to create them for and the ease of programming is pretty impressive. And yeah. all of that was kind of... Baxter opened the door to that market. Like, yeah. it sort of proved that there was a desire there if someone could yeah. create it halfway decent robot to fill it which they didn't do on that iteration no i think yeah. until then we because we also had two kuka arms and someone had to write this custom java code to actually even get it to do anything you coded a kuka arm in java i don't i wasn't the one doing that but yeah it's apparently and then uh, when we had the ones i know better are the fanic arms we used at iron robotics so oh, cool. we had to write uh, we had to have the stitch pen and where we would write the custom Fanuc software and Carol code, I forget. Uh, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, but I've, I never I've not done that. a whole lot with the Fanuc arms. Yeah, I'll be honest. Like I'm not. I'm not. I don't think I've ever programmed an industrial robot. It's not. It's yeah. not pretty. So Baxter was nice in that it gave you like this nice package. You could talk to it through ROS and actually get it to do stuff. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And you can do that with other arms. You just have to write weird. You'd have to write that to interface for yeah. Yeah. So it, it seems like there's kind of a bit of a lag there too because you can't really get directly in there so you have to go through something else but yeah 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 it's yeah you had to at least with a fanic you had to run its own cattle server then you would have a tcp connection you would own and then you can write a c plus plus wrapper around it and you can talk to it through the tcp connection but anything you do on the fanic itself you can't actually do any of the computation to uh, C++. What kind of lag does that add to, to being able to move the arm? Are you still talking to it Cartesian or like in joint space? Or? You can still give it Cartesian coordinates it needs to go to. Uh, it depends. So the nice thing about the FANUC was you could switch between joint space to end effector space and you can tell it, you either indicate what the individual joint angles need to be. Or That's pretty cool. It, so yeah. then it's doing its own forward kinematics mm -hmm. on the FANUC side. Yeah. And you're just parsing through, you know, where you want it to be at. Yeah. World space or world space, probably uh, arm space. Yep. Be your coordinate frame. Yeah. yeah. You could you could uh, you could switch between those coordinate frames pretty well, and uh, I don't know if you could do it over the TCP connection, but we used to do it all the time over there. Teach nice. pendant and uh, it just was very clunky, and very few people knew how to actually write that program. <laughs> it was just yeah. 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 It's It'll be interesting to see if any of these industrial robot makers adopt um, interoperability standards at all. I mean, I, I feel like it's... I mean, they'd know, have to at some point. It I hasn't imagine. been in their business interest to do so up until, like, what, 2023? Yeah. People still haven't... You know, like, I mean, there's been a push for that, I mean, as long as I've been around, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and so... I think that's also really interesting because robotics has come... Originally, it was just, you know, industrial automation where the robots did the same thing again and again. And so Fan and KUKA and all of these companies kind of came up and they served that very specific market. Yeah. But well, now... I think Fanuc wants you to have to buy Fanuc everything if, yep. you, if you use, like, one Fanuc arm in your factory. Like, a, they're trying to have an ecosystem, as far as I can tell. Yeah. And I probably should ask someone from Fanuc to come on. Maybe that'll be... Yeah, That'd be pretty guess. cool, yeah. yeah. Uh, I imagine it's different if you have a factory full of Fanuc arms doing the same thing versus you have mobile manipulators everywhere where your Fanuc arm is supposed to talk to this other system which is written completely in, I don't know, ROS or yeah. some other kind of communication protocol. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you want to have, you want to offer more control over the internal mechanics of the arm. Yeah, you want to, you want, maybe someone wants to use their own IK solver. Yeah, that was a, that was a frustration for us at, uh, at FormLogic. I know our, our head of our automation group didn't love that, you know, Fanuc wouldn't really let you under the hood and there was like a bit of a lag and it was an interface pain. So we ended up just 
I think we had a, um, I want to say it was a George Fisher System 3R, mm -hmm. I think is who made it, and we just had our own control cabinet, so like. Oh yeah, we, we, had, a, we had a control cabinet, yeah, it's just yeah. nuts. But yeah, yeah. It just drives we were talking to directly just to get around all that, but I mean, it was a lot of work to build all that, and, and you know, we had to have like engineers and techs like building all the custom stuff where if you buy something off the shelf, I mean, you can just plug it in and it goes. Uh, hypothetically, right? I mean, I, I'm I'm just glad I don't have to work with robot arms. To be honest, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. Perception doesn't require me to work with Fanuc arms. Like, it, there's a lot there, and it's not always available to you in the format you want. Yeah, it makes so, sense. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So then, perception then is perception for the mobility system. Uh, for the AMR, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. So, the so, again, there's a deviation there. So, originally at IAM Robotics, we used to have Swift, which was an autonomous mobile robot. That's where we had the Fanacom on it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So, at the time, um, the idea was that Swift is going to drive around e-commerce facilities and then do piece picking yep. for order fulfillment, which involves you have, you have shelves and racks, and each rack has multiple slots, and each slot has products in it. And then based on an online order, someone has to pick up, you know, three deodorant bottles and one bottle of shaving cream and one bottle of something yeah. like that. There was like an Amazon challenge on that, right? Like a lot of companies kind of got spun out of that, I thought. Interesting. Uh, I, I did not know that. I think Amazon had some kind of thing they put out to the public. I could be wrong. But yeah. I think like some of the people that were in my master's program were trying to do it based on like, you know, there was like some amount of money if you could solve this problem. Interesting. Probably way less than it was worth to Amazon to have the problem solved. But Maybe, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, Swift did it. Yeah. And Robotics awesome. was doing it. So nice. uh, it would, we would actually, so the idea would be the robot would drive down an aisle, for example, stop at a specific slot based on where the order is. And, you know, we had like a back-end uh, server running, which would tell us where each product is and talk to the warehouse management system and that's how we know where the inventory is and uh, so you're doing inventory cataloging and picking yeah there was no inventory cataloging at the time i mean we could have i mean we the perception system extracted enough information from it that we could have i think there's a lot of back-end enterprise software level stuff that would have had to happen for that to work and yeah a lot of people had their own inventory management system that makes sense so. uh, why try to sell them something they don't want so at the time so the robot could basically drive down to a slot it had a Fanacom, and on the Fanacom it had an end effector with a suction cup, and on the end effector was also an RGBD camera. Oh, so cool. you'd use the RGBD camera to localize because we had a system of markers around the warehouse. So you'd drive down. So you had to have your end effector looking a certain way? Yeah, you had to have the end effector pointing to the right, actually, all the time. Oh, when that's it's driving. Yeah. So as you're driving, uh, it was funny because the markers we had were also designed to allow for the motion blur and, uh, along the lateral axis. So we'd see, oftentimes we'd see, uh, you know, sometimes it'd be smeared across frames and we'd have to extract the code from that and the code had to be robust too. That's interesting. That's how do you do that? How do, how do you solve that problem? Uh, so ask? we had vertical barcodes with horizontal stripes. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> and uh, since we were driving, um, I think the camera's resolution was enough that we could pick up. I forget. So my colleague at the time, Mark Renfrew, he knows an absurd amount about uh, barcodes now. I believe the one we used was interleaved 2 by 4 I forget what it is. But uh, he, I, he actually wrote the, he, So this is, this is the funny thing. Is like I went to work at a robotics company and now I know too much about racking and a little too much about barcodes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, what? It's just, I always say there's no pure robotics like oh, outside no. of academia. Like it's always applied to some discipline. It's even in academia for the most yeah. part. Like it, you, you're like, how do we get a robot to do this surgery? How do we get a robot to look inside this nuclear yeah. reactor? Exactly. How do we get a robot to check out this sewer? How do we get a robot to build this building? How do we get a robot to sort our inventory in this factory? It's pretty much so. The fundamental yeah. problems of robotics exist only in the textbooks, you know. Then yeah. After you take them out, they become very domain specific to what you're trying to solve. Yeah, you always <laughs> learn stuff about your domain. Yeah, <laughs> it's not something I had came out of grad school, and that wasn't something I had in mind. But I mean, it was cool to learn about it. Um, it was also cool to see how many different types of racking there are actually and how much you actually for swift we needed to know things like what the shelf thickness was so we could correctly segment out parts of the world and we even used it during localization to track a shelf so we had the yaw and lateral offset correct you um, always have the 
luxury of uniform racking in a facility you're in? Uh, only on that shelf, I do. Ah, okay, so that you don't have a kid fig file, you have to perceive it, and then you have to keep that in mind when you're looking at that shelf, because it's not going to be changing. No, ideally, yeah. no. Uh, <laughs> however, I mean, once we got to our first customer deployment, it changed. Wait, what? <laughs> in real time? How that? No, no, no. I mean, like different racks at different widths of shelves on yeah. them. And so sometimes the end cap would have like a thicker shelf on it. That's kind of what I figured. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So we had, to, we had to modify that to allow for things like, oh, we've been tracking this for so long and suddenly the width changed. So Must not it? be the same shelf all of a sudden. Uh, and no, I mean, what's the likelihood that this is still the same shelf if it's in this domain? So it's a bit more like a tracking algorithm as opposed to saying, oh, I see a shelf now and this is your estimate. That's interesting. So uh, it came down to that. There's lots of things we did customer side. I mean, that was also helped by the time that we had two other RGBD cameras pointing front and back. So we were able to create a collapsed version of, so you have a 3D point cloud, you fit a ground plane, you collapse everything down to that ground plane, now you have a 2D occupancy grid. Oh, that's interesting. So. And what? the occupancy being occupied by a shelf or not. Yeah, I mean, yeah. occupied by anything. And the yeah. benefit of that is basically, um, as opposed to a LiDAR, which returns a range scan uh, from a single plane, if it is a 2D line scan LiDAR, which is pretty popular with AMRs. Yeah. Uh, this one actually gave you all the 3D information. It was projected down. So even if you had an overhanging obstacle and the camera saw it, it could be at different heights and you'd still know. And you can then encode the semantic information into your occupancy grid as to what, where that came from, what height was it at, and you can then choose according to that what your behavior. Oh, that's interesting. Be. So you might say like this grid square is occupied, but doesn't matter to me. And if the height of the bottom of the thing is above your robot's mass height, then you don't give a shit and you just go right through. In, in theory, you could. Uh, we never ended up using it that way. Okay. <laughs> it's just like. If there's an overhanging obstacle, it's probably, if the camera can see it, it's probably gonna obstruct the robot since the robot's very tall. Yeah, that makes sense. We never actually ended up using it that way, but um, we ended up using it for things on Bolt since we carried over a lot of that system. We ended up using it for things like uh, free space estimation. Uh, are you familiar with inverse sensor models? I am not. Okay, uh, so basically when you're creating an occupancy grid, you're trying to estimate the state of a cell and you're saying, given my sense of measurement and how much I trust it, what is the occupancy of this cell? And uh, it's- So it's like a probability occupied. Exactly, okay. yeah. And it, you know, simply put like a probability of one is occupied, probability of yep. zero is unoccupied. And, and probability uh, of like point eight is most likely occupied. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And it's typically, if you have a LiDAR laser scan and returns a range of say one meter, but there's going to be noise associated with that. So there's a Gaussian which defines what that noise is going to be like. So it's around, it's going to be between, at some probability distribution between, say, 0.8 to 1.2 meters with the mean at one. Yeah, something like that. So that's how you, you would encode that into, and that's your inverse sensor model. The thing is, it doesn't, there is no default inverse sensor model to tell you, oh, so wait, this space is free. Okay. Like there's no hit. This is, it's just free space. Yeah. But when you're seeing the floor and you're seeing the rest of the scene, in theory, you can say, well, this is free space. I mean, I'm getting hits from here, but it's from a camera, I know what it is. Yeah. I can segment out different parts of this and apply different inverse sensor models to it based on what I see, based on the semantic information provided to me. So Interesting. Uh, we were able to do stuff like that to actually make it more robust. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So like, um... Where do you threshold something for that if you're worried about, I mean, just approximately, like are you, it's like 0.6, stay away or? Oh, like that? So 0.5 is basically unknown. So okay. if, you, if, some, if you haven't seen something, if you haven't observed a certain cell, you just assume it's 0.5. Right? Yeah. And if you've looked at any sort of, if you've looked at any 2D maps from range, uh, line scan lidars, it's basically white means unoccupied, black is occupied, and gray is unexplored. It so, makes a lot of sense. It's, it's actually flipped because one there is now free and zero is black, which is occupied, which is treated differently. But that's Wait, not the why, point. Why is it that you invert it in that sense? I guess it just looks better. All right, fair enough. <laughs> so, uh, because I went with the default assumption first and then our occupancy grids were all black with white. I mean, it still looks fine. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah. So, I for, oh yeah. Uh, I forgot where I was. So we're talking about inverse sensor models and then... How did we get to the inverse sensor models? I'm trying to remember. 
Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's some strong uh, whiskey some, you have there. Yeah. Uh, they poured a lot in those glasses. Yeah. Um, so we've got inverse sensor models. We were talking about um, how Bolt navigates. Um, oh, uh, how how what we were doing with the camera data, basically. Okay. So creating your worldview, I think. Right. So, um, uh, so having that semantic information. So, oh, you were asking me how it's thresholded, right? Oh, yeah, right, so, right, yeah. Right, and right. So, but that was where I got to. It's yeah. Like approximately what you what you look for. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess you could say anything above point six, treated as an obstacle. You yep. can do that. You could also, if you wanted to be really fancy, you could do a distance transform, and then because it's going to go into a motion planning system. Yeah. So you could assign every cell has a cost associated with it with respect to its distance from the nearest obstacle. Yeah. So it's also easily parallelizable. Uh, oh, one of the other things at IM Robotics, which was really cool, uh, which I'm really happy I got to work on there is um, two things. First, all, we didn't use OpenCV or PCL or oh, nice. that. So we just wrote all of it on, on our own. Yeah. And we use a lot of CUDA because we had to run on, uh, we have to run on like, NVIDIA Jets and TX2s. Oh, cool. So we have access to a GPU. But also, I mean, not a lot of CPU. <laughs> yeah. So by by necessity, we end up having to use a GPU. So I got to like write a lot of CUDA for that. So That's cool. things like so when we look at things like this, it becomes important to consider well, how parallelizable is it. So yeah. things like a distance transform or fusing multiple sensors into an occupancy grid or uh, you know collapsing everything down or uh, you know segmenting out your point cloud so you can extract plain information. And doing all this at once. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you don't typically do. These are all different services running on different yeah. computers, so it doesn't. Really, it's kind so you've of. You've got multiple CX2s in one bolt. Yeah. Okay. That makes but sense. But also at the same time, you want it to be as quick as possible. So it, perception is typically like a pipeline. You run one process after the other. You do your filtering first. You do your um, uh, um, say you have your point cloud. You have your disparity or point cloud. You compute your vertices first. You do a depth filter, all of that, and then you start doing geometry and math on it. So yeah, that's interesting. So one person once said to me, I can't remember who it was, you know, um, give a perception engineer a um, compute device, and they'll figure out a way to use all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Just listening it's, to you talk, I'm like, <laughs> it's actually very easy to use a lot of it, especially with something like an image coming out of a camera. But like that, nothing as advanced as the TX2 has existed in human history up until like what, like five years ago? No, no. I and mean, there was also not like embedded GPUs weren't really a thing for for the most part. So. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Like that, that was one of the first few. Like I mean, exactly. was that the Nano? Uh, I don't know if the AGX came out later and the Nano. Uh, I think it was a TK1 that came out first, and then I think there was a TX1. I forget. Yeah. But then the TX2 came out, then the Nano, then the AGX came out, uh, and I think there was one more after that. Wait, did the Xavier NX come out? I think the Xavier NX came out after the AGX. Yeah, that makes sense to yeah. me. Because it's like a little bit stripped down, but it's yep. like way less expensive. Yep. And I think after that, I think they're about to release the Orin, which is like a beefed up version of the TX2. Oh, that's pretty cool. Similar to the AGX. I don't... I've heard about it. I've not actually like looked closely at the specs or looked at putting it in the project either. yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's once, once you have a stable platform things are running on like people are reluctant to change it so yeah which is why they're still selling tx2s and exactly like the ebay resale value was through the roof for a minute i don't know if it still is i wonder if the tx2 is that line's most popular product um we have or maybe in, the nanos are yeah, we had them in a project but then we we switched to the nx like you know early on in the development because mm -hmm. i think it like came out while we were like just hadn't even really integrated the TX2 correctly yet and mm -hmm. it made more sense with the specs for what we were trying to do. Right. And so, um, I don't know, I ended up putting a bunch of TX2s on eBay. <laughs> they were going for cash money for a minute there. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's actually, yeah. Nanos became way more popular though. $99 for a yeah. pretty nice company. But I mean, that's like, I don't know, one of my friends at NVIDIA referred to that as, and it could be anyone, I've got more than one friend at NVIDIA, I referred to it as a... Uh, a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> the GPU? Yeah, they're like, it's basically just a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, is the GPU even that great in one of those? I mean... For what I wanted to do one time, uh, so... And like, I mean, we have a robot in here running in the Nano, you know, that little five kilogram Johnson I showed you. I mean, you it's great for things that a Raspberry Pi does, but you want yeah. some acceleration on the side, so you use a GPU. Yeah. Uh, I found that, so, <laughs> when I started out, 
robotics was basically my hobby, which became my job. So for a while, I thought maybe I'll pursue it as a hobby Same. as well. So I thought I'd write my own slam library on the side. And cool. I bought a TX2 and I bought an Intel RealSense and I was playing around with Visual Slam. Yeah, I, those were interesting to mess around with. I mean, yep. the RealSense for 200 bucks that you could get all that. Oh, yeah. 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 The RealSense were, they were pretty nice. Uh, I think I got in 2018 when the API was still a bit... In, like, it had some interesting things going on with it. Brutal. Uh, I think they got quite a lot. Uh, they became quite a bit more stable over yeah, the years. Yeah, I feel like the USB was still a failure point even in like 2021. Mm -hmm. Like it was still kind of a kind of a bitch to try to get it not to suffer USB outages. And there was a minute there where if you contacted Intel support, like they would tell you to use like an SSR to switch power off and on. To get around that issue. The uh, one of the things that I am because I mean we use like Orbeck Astras and they also had USBs and uh, USB has issues. Yeah, I don't trust it. No. <laughs> so one of the things is, oh, you have USB outages. Slap a ferrite core on it, see if it works. Oh Jesus! And you slap enough ferrite cores until it does work, and then that's like such a hobbyist way to go about solving <laughs> a problem. Like not even like. They just put a ferrite core. Yeah, like uh, a ferrite bead around it. Hope it that, works. That'll fix your issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I still have my real sense, and uh, they stopped making those for a while. I think. I think they started back up recently, but I think did they start stopped. back up? I thought that they discontinued it. I didn't read the news that they kept. They started making I them again. I think they started back up, and they also have this really nice. Uh, makes, I mean, people love them. Oh yeah. Yeah. But then there's a bunch of good competitors now, like the Framos is a thing at this point, and then what is there, like the, the Zed cams? The Zed's have been around for a while, though. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, so is the real sense. That's fair. Yeah. The, uh, I, I do know that, I mean, some of the people who worked on things like the tracking camera from RealSense, which would do visual rocketry for you. Yeah, the T265, yep. I think. Yep. Yeah, it was really nice, and I really wanted to get my hands on it, but yeah. I didn't get a chance to. I just eBayed a couple. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I, I think a bunch of people from that team ended up going to Israel and started like, a computer vision company there. That's interesting. Yeah. I did hear that there was like an Israeli firm that was involved in the Microsoft Connect and the RealSense. So, so I wonder if they were like already there. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, and yeah. they just kind of got pulled into those projects as contract engineers. Yeah, yeah. like the, the one, one I'm thinking of is called, called Argo AI, not not the Argo, Argo from Pittsburgh. It's just R and Geo. R and then Geo. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Argo. Yes. Yeah. That's and interesting. they're from Israel, and then they do like slam and box solutions. So they use uh, they. I think, I think they, they were the original team on the real sense somewhere, and then they ended up going to Israel. I think, I think they just came out of stealth last year. I think. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that seems, seems like fun. fun. Yeah. Especially if it doesn't have a USB port on it. That I don't know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're sending the whole box, so I imagine they have their own custom connectors inside. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. But yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's awesome. awesome. It is hilarious, too, that there's, like, another company that just called themselves Argo. I feel like the Israeli companies have hilarious names sometimes. And I won't give examples because I don't want to get anyone in trouble. But oh, should like, I not mention the company by name? No, that's fine. But, I mean, I, I just more meant, like, so there's one I'm thinking of in particular where, like, the name sounds like something that would be very politically incorrect in English. But, like, it just doesn't even occur to them because they're Israeli that, like, that could be the case. Yeah, and, like, like that's, that's the one I'm not gonna name because I don't want to create a big stink here. That's right. You don't get demonetized. Yeah, or like I mean, I don't make any money on this podcast, but more so, like I just don't want to, you know, piss off that company because yeah, like, that's right. Nice people, I know the founders. <laughs> yeah, you know, again, it's it's well meaning. It's just like like have you heard about like the the Chevy Nova like in Spanish markets not doing well because like Nova means like no go. In, in Spanish, so you know, but, but like you know, in English, it's just like like a super Nova, Nova. Yeah. Yeah. Super Nova. and so yeah, it didn't even occur to Chevy like the that might flop in that particular. So it's, it's, it's like that. I wonder what will happen if they want to expand the American markets. Then, yeah, well, I mean they're already doing it, and I think oh, good for them. Yeah, I'll tell you after the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, no, I mean I, I think that exists, you know. I, there's always hilarious company names in international markets. Like I think you just you have false conjugates that are funny sometimes. <laughs> That's it. It's just it's just what it's going to be. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I feel, feel like, like they have, have some interesting tech going on. This way. Right? I mean, it'd be they have some really nice computer vision going on there. It'd be pretty yeah. Cool. Well, it, it seems, seems to be the case. case. I mean, like the, the fact, fact that, that like you know, know Israelis made like the real sense and the mm-hmm. precursor. You know, the um, Xbox, Xbox Connect. I mean, well, I know the Israelis made that. I, I that's what I heard. Is it was an Israeli contract engineering firm. I kind of wonder which one because I'm making friends with more Israelis every day now. Um, you know, through some some arrangements we have with like Gallenbar's company, four one two by nine seven two, and, and a few others. Um, and uh, I, I might know the people that worked on it now if I can talk a little deeper. But I'll find out later. Yeah. If you're listening and you worked on the on the uh, Intel RealSense and or the Microsoft Connect, and you're Israeli, send me an email. <laughs> Podcast at SKA dot solutions. Yep. And uh, we'll, we'll put text in the description. Yeah, if you want to talk perception, happily you, you can, can find me on LinkedIn. Like, <laughs> there's only one of me there, so like, my name's pretty unique, and you'd be hard pressed to find someone else. So please send me a message if you want to talk perception. Nice. <laughs> this is a very shameless plug there. No, I don't even have a channel. channel. I just yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, it's a plug, plug away. That's, yeah. that's part of what this is for. Yeah, but um. So what other interesting uh, things are going on in the perception space? Like any, um, I guess, what made you want to go down that road? Like, when so, did you pick uh, any robotics program in grad school or you know even before? Like, oh, you, you want the long answer or the short answer? It's fair enough. I, I guess I'll just start how I got into robotics. Yeah, cool. Oh, we got time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll get started with how I got into robotics in the first place. So, um, I think it was around. 16 or so, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And in India, engineering is really popular, like really popular. Everyone's parents are basically pushing them into engineering and you know, you have to take these really intense entrance exams to- I think you were telling me a little bit about yeah. this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And uh, so I think people start when they're in eighth grade or ninth grade, starting going, so they start, they go to school and then they go to school outside of school to actually prepare for these tests. Yeah. And it's just and not. You're three years late because now you're. 16. <laughs> yeah, I'm 16. Still don't know. I still, I still don't know. know. And yeah. kind of a delinquent at the time. And, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> there. As we all are. Been there. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> so uh, now I'm 16 and um, wasn't sure what I want to do. Originally, I wanted to be a zoologist and I thought I would do something with that. But nice. uh, the. <laughs> it's going to sound very corny, but one summer, like 2010, we were watching Iron Man on TV and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. So then I started taking an interest in technology, and I thought, I like this, so, you know. Uh, I found this website um, from this guy who went to CMU at the time, his name is John Parmesano. Okay, I don't know him yet. It's called, I mean, he, this was 2010, I found it, so I started in 2004, so. Nice. He's long gone. Long gone. <laughs> yeah, I, I, he, uh, he, was, he was at CMU. Um, Probably works for like Amazon or something. Now. I think he worked at the Naval Research Lab. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, the off, right. Office of Naval Research? Yep. I, I think, think so. Those guys do interesting stuff. They've been kind of more on my radar lately. Yeah. He, uh, he started this website called Society of Robots, and he used to build robots as a hobby. So he put his robot, he, he would put his builds on, and he'd have tutorials on how he built them. So I discovered that, and I thought robots are cool. So I do that. And how do you go to college for robots? You couldn't at the time. Like it's, it's, no. I think they have undergrad programs now in robotics. I think WBI has one. I think yeah. that's the only one. Party Mullen's got to have one. I would hope. I mean, maybe they, for, for a while you could get a robotics. I think you could major, but you had to have another major, or maybe you could minor in robotics. But you couldn't major in robotics. I've seen that. Like people major in mechanical or computer science and minor in robotics. I've seen yeah. that quite a bit. But like a degree in robotics is something. Until like you get a master's, yeah, you can't you can't really do it as an undergrad. Yeah, when I when I got my undergrad degree, I went for computer science and business administration because mm-hmm. it was the closest I could get. And I didn't really care. I was gonna. I would have. I would have done electrical. I would have done software. I would have done mechanical. But it was like I, I just kind of got the furthest, the fastest in computer science. Mm-hmm. I decided to lock that one down. Yeah, I I decided on electronics engineering for that. I was like, oh, I need mechanical engineering. I need to do circuits, and I need to know how to code. The yeah. circuit seemed like a middle ground. I go do that. Yeah. That's I didn't have to take physics to do computer science. Which, um, yeah. I was just lazy. I didn't want to do as much uh, math and science. Little did I know, 
It's Plus, just, that would screw me. <laughs> it, it, uh, IV, yeah. I mean, I'm glad I had. I went to electronics engineering. We had to do all more math. Uh, kind of see my ass when I went to graduate. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's how I got screwed, right? It's like I didn't realize yeah. that math would actually be important. I mean, to be fair, TAs tried to tell me. <laughs> yeah, what do you know? At least they tried. I mean, I, I still came to graduate school and I like, oh, I had no idea you would use this in this way. Like, I had no idea what why the basis of a you know vector was important or why the linear algebra was important or oh dude linear algebra i like didn't even take it as an undergrad i was i was so owned by the time i got there i was like trying to binge the gilbert strain lectures and like <laughs> hoping i could reverse engineer it or figure it out from context like i was able to do as an undergrad <laughs> i used to watch it i used to watch lectures at 1.5 speed trying to you know, taking as much as I could, like could. Yeah. and reality, you miss things and you go back and do the same thing again. So <laughs> I've been there. Uh, but then, yeah, I, I decided to go to electronics engineering. Um, I used to build stuff at home, so you know, I used to get those AVR microcontrollers, and uh, picks were too expensive, and also I couldn't find them in India at the time. So yeah. Atmel was readily available. Nice. Right. So like you had Mega Eight or you had Mega Two Fifty Six and stuff like that. And those are more capable microcontrollers anyway. Aren't they? they are. They are. Yeah. I mean. Well, again, I don't, I don't know if the PIC versus AVR war is still going on. Wait, didn't PIC buy Atmel? I don't know. I, yeah, yeah, I think it doesn't matter anymore, but at the time, there was, there was a big divide when people used Atmel and people used PIC. Well, that's interesting. And uh, if I went on... I learned on the, on the basic snap. That was the first marker control I ever used. Oh, I never used basic snap. That was a piece of garbage. I mean, you couldn't do anything parallel at all. Like, it was all serial. <laughs> And, and like it, it took, took forever, forever, so like it, your robot could sort of like move an axis, and then it was over here, and it could do a thing, and you had to move another axis. I mean, I, I could have gotten smart and like probably used multiple ones, but like I was 13 years old the first time I. Was. You were way younger than I was. Ah, I mean, you were still pretty young. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> At 13, what was I doing? Uh, think Let's not do that. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, I don't know. So, I guess I started building those microcontrollers at home, and uh, you know, that's how you learn. You know, what is what is an oscillator? What is uh, linear regulator? How do you get power supply to your microcontroller and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, and then you program microcontroller. You learn the bootloader is. You learn uh, how to actually how SPI works, how I squared C works, all those things. Yeah. And I thought oh, it's always easier said, said than done, done to get I squared C working on something. Oh man, it's. I have used, so in grad school, I had to use I squared C on one of the projects we had. Dude, it's a pain in the ass. I had to do an undergrad on a, um, we had this Lego based unmanned search and rescue robot assignment in Howie Joseph's class. Mm -hmm. And, oh, nice. Uh, so, yeah, general intro to robotics was the name of the class. And that was an arduous class. I, I was cross registered from the University of Pittsburgh and, and that at CMU. Mm -hmm. And it was like more work than four pit courses I was taking at the same time, all put together. <laughs> And um, including the robotics course, pit. <laughs> so there was. I think I got, I, you know, I, I got like a B in the pit robotics course because I did so much bandwidth shifted into Howie's class. Mm -hmm. But there was one where it was um, we we're supposed to do an unmanned search and rescue robot. So it was like this little robot with a camera, and like for like bonus points, you could put you know non-Lego actuation on it. So I had two hobby servos like uh, for a pan tilt axis for the camera oh, yeah. and then I had a bunch of tip 120s uh, controlling LED arrays for illumination. Mm -hmm. I had one general illumination array that was like I pushed LEDs into like Lego techni Technics pieces mm -hmm. and then I hot glued them in place and then I soldered <laughs> the leads together and then I had these tip 120s like controlling power to those and then I had like four more LEDs that were in line with the camera that I could separately turn on. And then I had an Arduino that talked I2C to the Lego NXT. Mm -hmm. And then you controlled it from the NXT and you could control those non-Lego axes. Oh, nice. And yeah, so I had like the RJ11 jack that it used it. But it took like, it was like, I feel like it was at least 20 hours to get that working. <laughs> and for a student, I mean, you know, that feels arduous. Oh man. And so it was, yeah, it was, it was, I think I made the most, my group made the most complicated one, but we were all so sleep deprived by the time we went in. I drove it through a wall. 
failed the assignment. It's funny how often sleep deprivation goes hand in hand with robotics. I don't think it's very safe, but I mean, yeah. It, well, I mean, this was like a fucking maybe it weighed like you know two yeah, kilograms. Like, how often like, people say, "Oh man, this was sleep deprived." You hear that a lot coming from people who work in robotics. It's just, yeah. Uh, do you hear it from like professionals as much though? I feel like it's more students that. Oh, it's mostly students. Yeah. 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 I, I, I mean, those guys are running machine tools, sleep deprived, like mills and lathes, and you know, I mean, they're probably driving cars and. I don't want to go into. Never mind. I was at my robotics lab, and we had CNC machines and CNC our molds for our. Um, what are those strain based capacitive sensors we were building? Oh, interesting. Uh, it's just not. So sometimes I'm happy I go back because I go to finish up. So oh, Jesus. Just, uh, it was an interesting time. Do you want us to cut that? Or can we... uh, no, I think it's fine. I, didn't, I mean, I don't drink a whole lot and I don't really get too drunk, but sometimes I would just really wonder, like, this is the best time to do it, but I really need to get this done. Yeah. 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 I, I got, got in trouble once for being, like, wasted in the CMB Robotics Club. I wasn't using any tools, but. I just I, I was drinking on campus and I um, I lived quite a ways away, and so I think I just like came and was like writhing around on their table there, and uh, I the next day like uh, the officer showed me the security camera footage and were like what's up with this and I'm like would you rather I had driven home and they were like good point excellent <laughs> point so they, they were okay with it from that perspective yeah. Uh, again, yeah, wasn't, wasn't running tools. <laughs> yeah, I won't, I won't claim I've never run certain tools like with a little bit of a buzz, but I don't know. I try not to with heavy tools, but I only think that's because it was grounded so far into me in the in the trainings. People were like, you know, like don't operate these in pair, and I'm like, all right, yeah. Oh, well, let's just say I uh, do a perception. <laughs> I don't know what you that. Worst thing that's going to happen is the uh, robot thinks it's. 10 meters away from it. Chuck, Chuck, Chuck Whitaker at the Field Robotics Center had this great primer he'd give uh, where he'd talk about like how you should never operate like you know the Bridgeport Mills or like the lathes or anything under the influence of, of you know illicit or illicit substances just impaired. And then he's like, you know, I've never caught anybody, you know, wasted using these machines. But what I have caught people, you know, under the influence of using these machines constantly is sleep deprivation. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just like, all the time. I mean, I mean one, one of the things was, I, in grad school, I had long hair, so short length hair. Oh, cool. I had that in high school. Oh, yeah. I didn't have the bald spot back then. <laughs> <laughs> so, kind of jealous. I was already bald by grad school. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a blessing and a curse. So, I always lean over, like, the moves I was making, and one of the warning labels there was, don't, don't get a tie cord, cord or something. Don't, don't let things that are dangling off your cord. Yeah, yeah that's how that girl from, or woman from Yale, Yale got, you know, her neck snapped. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and a lathe. She got sucked in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just, just uh, I had, until then, I was staunchly against ponytails because I thought, man, ponytails are weird. Yeah. But uh, I, I saw, saw that label and I realized what I was doing. I was like, okay, I think, I think I'm going to start wearing my hair. hair. Yeah. It's so weird. It's, uh, I mean, that's why so many engineers wear ponytails. I guess so. It makes sense. Yeah. It's a functional thing. But you see, like, IT guys doing it. They don't need to worry about that. So I guess, I guess they're leaning into, like, servers and you get yeah. some fans, maybe. I maybe. I don't, I don't think, though. I don't think Sam would do that, though. Like, it's just chop it off, I guess. Yeah. Not the, the little dinky ones, ones they've got the server. You can just it's, yank yeah. that back up. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Where, where was I? Oh, the yeah. college, basically. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I got into college for electronics engineering. Uh, first year, I was kind of upset at the lack of robotics in my college. Uh, I went to a college affiliated with the University of Mumbai. And uh, when, when I was there, I think my second year, I found out, have you heard of SAE Baja? SAE Baja, yeah, those were like the, um, the, the, the car. yeah, I think I have a LinkedIn photo of me in, yeah. in an electric one mm -hmm. uh, that we sponsored the team for. Oh, nice, uh, nice. Our, our the autonomous racing. Sweet. Yeah, yeah we, we didn't have autonomous racing, racing but yeah. I mean, my college had a team, so I thought, that's cool, robotics, yeah. mechanical engineering, I'll go there. Sweet. So for a year and a half, I worked with SAE Baja and FSA Supra. So the transmissions. I mean, it was the only electronics guy there, so they told me to also do the electrical systems. <laughs> and I did a data acquisition system for the Supra car we had, so like microcontroller with IMUs and you know uh, 
What are the Supra cars? Like, I know the Toyota Supra. Uh, no, no, I mean, it's, it's Supra is the name of the competition, so it's in the people that formed a Ford car, I think. So that's more formula racing. Interesting. And SE Baja is more for all-terrain vehicle cars, you know? So it's yeah. like a buggy you driving on draft terrain. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So that I use as a way to learn mechanical engineering. So that's what I saw that people who actually build these things spend so much time in design, spend maybe 80% of your time designing things, thinking through test cases, doing all the math, doing analysis on you know, answers. Um, you go through all of that, and then when you're fabricating, prototyping, you quickly iterate through a prototype, because now you have a good initial understanding of what you want to do, what it is you want to accomplish. And uh, once you build your prototypes and you've tested them, you start fabricating your final assembly, you've got, you have a pretty good idea of what the car's going to be like, and then it's just testing and tuning after that. Cool. Um, so, so I found that that ended up organizing your work so well, and you kind of iron out a lot of things you've caught. Ideally, you shouldn't have gone to fabrication with in the first place. Yeah, all the time. I mean, especially as a student. Right. Exactly. So that was that was probably my most valuable lesson from there. And then uh, after finishing that off, by the end of my second year, I came back from Baja and Supra, and I thought, you know, um, a couple of friends of mine said, "Have you heard of Robocon?" So, Robocon is a contest hosted by the Asia Pacific Broadcasting Union. Oh, cool. Uh, so, like, all the countries that are part of that have a robotics contest. So, every year there'll be a problem statement, uh, statement that's released. And uh, students from all these colleges have one year to basically design and build their robots, and then you go and compete. Nice. So, during, this is in 2015, I think I was in my third year of engineering, so we founded the team for Robocon. And uh, I was captain of that team because I was the only one with the Baja experience. <laughs> how to build a robot at the time, with the tiny one, so we could we'd give this a shot. Yeah. And it was funny how applicable that same process was to robotics. And yeah. I took all I learned there in terms of how you structure an engineering problem and then just, just ran with it. And uh, so 2015, the problem statement for Robocon was badminton, so we had to build two robots that really badminton. Uh, like, like a life, uh, like Olympic size score. Oh, that's against, against, against other robots? Or yeah, against, against other robots. Against, against a, the other college team with two robots there. Yeah. So, so your robots will either be autonomous or you can control them with a PS3 joystick. Uh, I'm guessing the non autonomous ones did better. Maybe I'm wrong. Actually, uh, there were no uh, fully autonomous ones, didn't really do well, but there were some semi autonomous ones. That's interesting. So there was this, uh, uh, this is called, called COEP, College of Engineering Pune. Uh, they set up, I think they had a light out on one end of the core, and then their robot's positioning was done autonomously. They were tracking the robots. And once they were there, actually aligning the rackets and hitting the shuttle back, that was done annually. That's, so they, they, they do that thing where you have like a miniature of the robot's kinematic chain and you aim it like that and the person just hits it? Or? Uh, I think yeah. positioning yeah. it, so basically arriving at the point where the shuttle needed to be, yeah. add it through the LiDAR. The I don't know how they were actually tracking the shuttle. I didn't know you could track a shuttle with a LiDAR. I don't think they were. I'm not really sure how they were doing it, but they had a lot of, because the biggest problem we had was aligning, the, getting the robots into position and then hitting back. Yeah. They were doing it seamlessly. That's pretty cool. I, I, I still, still, to this day, how do they control the rackets? Because I feel like that's... Oh, uh, so rackets themselves, I don't think they had the level of control that they were able to control the force on the rackets. They were doing the same thing we were doing. We had pneumatic actuators and pressurized air, so basically hit back the same uh, force every yeah. single time. It just mattered what the alignment of the racket was with respect to the shuttle. Okay. So they still, I mean, they weren't perfect, so they still get hit out of the core all the time. But yeah. They had a much higher rate of return than anyone else. Oh, that's cool. That was really impressive to watch. At least at the time. I might be, like, to my 20-year-old mind, it was really uh, blew my mind. Yeah. Maybe if I go back and look at those videos, it may seem a bit more clunky. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, at the time, it was fantastic. But, uh, I mean, we performed really well there. We had a, so one of the defending champions of India is near my university. They won that contest seven years in a row. Oh, wow. And we got paired up against them in the third match. Brutal. And uh, we ended up battling them to a draw. <laughs> so <laughs> my colleague got really, like, everyone knew us after that. Nice. And, uh, and, and then, then we lost the rematch. And then, uh, like, I mean, everyone knew us and we got really popular after that. And then, and then we went back in 2016, which was my final year at school, uh, at, at, uh, at that college. And then we ended up ranking sixth in all of India. 
Nice. Uh, and also, we, we had, had a different problem statement there, so we had a bit of a different set of rules. But we took what we learned. Out of how many universities and colleges? I think it was like 130. Wow. Yeah, okay, that's, that's impressive. impressive. Yeah. But, but I mean, also, there's a bit of a bias. Like, a lot of universities come from the remote parts of India, don't really have the funding to actually. Yeah, I, I've seen that in like first robotics or yeah. like battle bots. You'll see some stuff where it's just super jank because of budgeting. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot of that, and then they can't really compete. But I feel bad for them because they don't have the resources to do it. Um, but again, I mean, it felt really good. Like you're still going up against the top courses in India, yeah. still coming up sixth. So one of the funniest things I ever saw at a first competition was I saw a team building the robot in the pit area. Yeah, they didn't have a robot that they came with. They oh, were attempting to like do their homework like the day before it was due. But they, they, uh, they were but act- they not just assembling it? Like they disassembled it? No, they were like putting eighty twenty together and trying to figure out their design parameters and like I was like, How did you guys not <laughs> well, like, yeah, well, there's certainly ambitious off them. Yeah. <laughs> if the I don't think they. I don't think they want. I don't think they even got a drivetrain together. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was definitely an interesting time. It's like speaking of drivetrains, like we got so we got exposed to so many things. We were all using holonomic wheels because we wanted like unconstrained motion. Yeah. It's really using different. That makes sense for that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but, but then we ended up but also like all of these would be on like a wooden core and, like struck there'd be all sorts of weird things. That you should look at yeah. um, every year the problem statement changes. So I think twenty sixteen there was a it was renewable energy. So you can use renewable energy sources to basically have one robot control the other through like an obstacle main, uh, this thing, like an obstacle. Wait, so when you say renewable energy sources, you mean like the robots have to be solar panel? No, no, just the method of controlling the other robot. So you can, like most people, just, we ended up using a BLDC motor, a fan on it to use. Like, there was nothing we knew about. We had lipo batteries. We <laughs> so we were using a fan to effectively push the other robot with a sail on it and control its motion. Oh, that's interesting. So the other robot couldn't have actual drive, uh, like active, um, like actually just was propelling it, but it couldn't have an active steering system. Yeah. So we can align the sails in the steering system and then it couldn't follow the line to basically get to follow its obstacle course to get oh, to the so so that one we actually ended up ranking sixth in. Nice. Um, so, yeah, I mean, then I decided to do a master's, so I came to the University of Maryland for the master's program there in robotics. It was a, I think when I was applying to colleges, uh, universities, in, this was 2015, 2016, I was looking at, um, I said, show me all the universities with the degree in robotics. There were only 10 of them. Uh, yeah, I think, I think the, the, the mistake I made was not actually looking at um, does the mechanical engineering department have a robotic specialization? Should I go to this lab? Or yeah. should I, I didn't do that. I just looked at degrees of robotics and then I yep. looked through that. I so only I applied to Carnegie Mellon for my master's. And you got in. That's right. Yeah. I never shot it. I got lucky. <laughs> I mean, I applied to see in your anime. So it's, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, think yeah, I, I got incredibly lucky. I didn't even look at my Jerry score. <laughs> I just took it and sent it to CMU and it was a binary. It was like either I'll get in or I won't. Yeah. <laughs> but you got in. It worked out for you. Yeah. I think it probably helped that I knew a lot of people there from when I was an undergrad and cross mm-hmm. registered from that. That's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. yeah. So I had. Um, I don't know. I can't remember if I got like a recommendation from a CMU professor like on my CMU application, mm-hmm. but I mean I definitely knew people in the RI that were like considering my application by the time I applied. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> if I had that, I would have done it too. But uh, yeah, no, it, definitely. Uh, I, I actually sometimes think maybe it's a good thing I didn't go to CMU, but the fees. It's a little cliche. Yeah. Like, Still in debt. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it looked really expensive, so I'm glad I didn't get in. Yeah, it was not cheap. Uh, yeah. it's, it's quite a bit of coin. Yeah, but I went to UMD. At the time, the idea was oh, I could design, build, program robots completely. Like mm-hmm. no sense of specialization. You, you come, come out of, you know, you're ranked sixth in India, you're a 22 year old, you have a big ego. And you come to graduate school and uh, realize, oh man, I don't actually know as much as I thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I can't build an entire robot by myself to do anything that's noteworthy. So yeah. it, um, 
I had to sort of decide where I wanted to go in terms of my specialization. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. So I found myself in a similar position. Yeah, yeah. I, I imagine grad yeah. school is humbling. I, I realize I, I'm kind of adult compared to some of these other people where I'd always, like you, I kind of wipe the floor with everyone else academically up until then. Yeah. yeah. And so like, I was valedictorian like in a lot of different, like in high school I was, like every high school I went to, and I went to a bunch. And, as an undergrad, I mean, I would like break the curve on like 200 person lecture halls, you know, in engineering programs. And, you know, I, I had to get used to not being the smartest one in grad school because I wasn't anymore. I mean, <laughs> so. those guys there were also the smartest ones in their rooms. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. But also at the same time, it's like there's a difference between being good at an undergrad thing versus coming to grad school and seeing people who've devoted years and years to research and have the depth of understanding of a certain problem. It's just, it doesn't compare. And, uh, and that's, that's what, what I found. I thought, okay, what do I do? So I started the micro robotics lab and set up a project. She's a CMU now. Oh, cool. So she runs the micro robotics lab now. But uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I started there and I got in through there. And that was my introduction to research. Nice. So uh, that's where I learned how you know you frame a problem, what questions you ask, what makes a good research paper, and if you're looking at a if you're looking, if, if you're asking a question, how do you go about testing? Like what the scientific method does? How do you frame a hypothesis? How do you run your experiments? How do you look at your results and make sense of them? So, but then I realized, like, I don't do micro robotics, and I was taking so, classes in perception. What's considered to be micro robotics? Like, I'm presumably small robots, but like, how yeah. small is a micro robot? Uh, to give you an idea, anywhere from like a few centimeters to. Robots that I don't know the scale anymore, but robots that needed microfluidics to work. Oh, interesting. Yeah. What are microfluidics? I <laughs> forgive my. I spent a year and a half there, but my best description is going to be fluids flowing through really tiny pipes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you need that to make it work? Uh, I think so. Mostly. So one of the things they were studying was things like how do insect mandibles work? How do um, how do Tiny insects at that scale actually perform locomotion. Oh, that's sort of interesting. Yeah. And then how do you actually get things like uh, like a tiny robot to do the same? Yeah. What kind of actuator can you actually uh, design and uh, create to actually do that for you? What sort of, how, what are the forces that it encounters? What materials does it need, uh, does it need to be out of? So you can't if you're trying to make something in animal to scale, can't you know machine out of aluminium? Yeah. So it makes sense. There were a lot of problems. nanometer scale. I mean you. you you're basically in the wrong chemistry. Well, actually, I don't think it was nanometer scale. It was definitely millimeter scale. So okay. Na not nanometer scale. But, yeah. uh, so the project I was on was uh, building, uh, helping this PhD student build capacitor skins to fit on airplane wings. So when the airplane wings shift, you can use the change in capacitance to detect, uh, to get an estimation of strain on the wing. Oh, interesting. And then you can presumably compensate with exactly. the Exactly. Yeah, your engines and, and uh, control surfaces. One of my projects was considered avionics. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, I, I, it, it would actually be considered avionics. It, it was funded by the Air Force, actually. So, I nice. it was. so um, what that got turned into my project where I used one of those sensors to determine ground effects in a quad rotor. Oh, cool. So, the closer you are to the ground, what is the airflow turbulence like and how do you compensate? And you look at that by the, the kind of the wobbliness of the... Exactly. You look at the change in capacitance and determine what that sort of turbulence does to you. That makes sense. Um, and then that turned into... I think I finally got a research assistantship there, which was doing this rat whisker sensor. So rat whiskers are powerful haptic tools. For yeah. rats, they use that to actually navigate them. I think cats do that too. Cats do that too. Yeah, for them, for them chasing them, they're very similar biologically. Yeah. So how do you actually fabricate a sensor that allows you to have a long whisker and determine the strain based off of that? Oh, interesting. So and if you have max, so like you pinch it, you actually no, you make pressure. you make polymers and then you have similar capacitive printings on them. Oh, interesting. Based off your, uh, I forget what it was. I think it was called PDMS. I forget what it was called. This is five years ago. But um, based on that, you determine what the change in strain has been. And that tells you how much risk has been displaced. And then if you have an array of them, you can reasonably get a good estimation of what the surface looks like. Pretty cool. Uh, that, that was where the project was supposed to go. <laughs> 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 I, uh, I ran into limitations with it. 
uh, and then I think by then graduated, so I didn't, didn't really see the light of day. Yeah. And then I couldn't go on. I feel like a lot of projects headed to school were like that. It happens. Graduate school, that's what happens. And then yeah. I toyed with the idea of doing a PhD there, but I was also working with this other professor, Yanis Salomonos, who runs the Perception and Robotics Group. And he was doing a visual laboratory then on drones basically. Yeah. I thought, man, this is so cool that I've been doing this. <laughs> and I thought I wanted to do a PhD with it. Uh, then I realized I have research experience in a completely different field. So it doesn't really, I won't, I won't directly be able to go to a PhD program. Um, yeah. So I figured it'd be easier to get a job instead doing a session. And Plus you'll, you'll be less in debt. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I was wrong actually. It wasn't easy to get a job in the It was pretty hard. <laughs> I had to look for a while. And uh, I graduated, and then after looking and looking and compensating my terrible C skills at the time, uh, I eventually, you know, I was training in that too. And uh, eventually, you know, I interviewed around the robotics and decided to give me a shot. So this was 2018. That's how I got into perception. Basically. Nice. So you kind of just worked your way up to lead on that team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, I think having like be interested in what I wanted to do really helped with that. So I mean, I always I also was following Yana's research at the time, and I was interested in visual slam. And um, I, I I kind of well, I like the general problem of perception, which is the fact that you're taking the different senses you have and you're trying to stitch together a belief of the world. And since even our perception is incorrect, right? I mean, sure. Yeah. I, I have errors coming into my my eyes are not perfect. Yep. Yeah. The color information I'm reading from. Uh, say your shirt is not going to be the same your eyes read from your shirt yep, okay. no, maybe it's not necessarily going to be the same red or uh, so it's not necessarily see things with the best geometric fidelity so uh, we do a lot of compensation because there's sensing and then there's perception which is the interpretation of that information that's interesting and uh, that never that, that piece really interests me and you could have like you know like I don't know Messed up eyes or something, or and I mean, I do have messed up eyes. Fair enough. It's <laughs> my sense of taking glasses soon enough, and I went bald, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you compensate. Like you figure out how to, you know, like make up for it. Exactly, and then it's funny because things like um, maybe, maybe you know, there are differences differences between each of your eyes, but you still. Uh, fair, fair, fairly accurate depth estimation. Well, fairly accurate is a relative term at this point. So, uh, things like that are pretty interesting to me. And um, one of the things I kind of wanted to work on is Yana's lab about an active perception. Or at the time, at least. I'm, I don't know that, what they're doing now. But one of, the thing, one of the questions they were asking is if you're looking at something and you don't really fully see it, you will move. If something's far away and you kind of can make out what it is, you will move in order to maximize your information. Oh, interesting. So you will take action because typically it's like sense. Like walking up to it. Yeah, typically in traditional robotics, like you sense first, then act, and then you sense again. Yeah, sense, act, plan, or sense, plan, act. Yeah, sense, plan, act. Yeah. Uh, so in this instance, you're planning to actually sense better. And you're... You're driving off context you have of what this might be, and then you're sort of narrowing the possibilities yeah. and determining what this might be. So that that's a very interesting problem to me, and uh, you know if I ever get a chance, I'd like to get to work on that. So you walk from say one point in the city to another, and you walk with five people, and people are fairly familiar with the city, but they don't know their route. Yeah. And you ask them how you got from point A to point B, they're going to tell you like the landmarks they tell you. Uh, that you had to pass uh, pass by to get to the point B, there's going to be a fair amount of overlap in them. Yeah. So why did they all pick the same landmarks? Why are they important in this context? So why is attention focused on them? Why out of all the things they see, those are the things that show up? That's interesting. So it, I mean, it depends on context. It depends on what you know about the city, what yeah. you know that thing to be. And there's so much there, I feel like we're just scratching the surface right now. Yeah, this, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Maybe prominence? I, I don't know. Like there's, I mean, there's a lot we do with uh, motion. Like, like did you see a neon watch sign that's flashing or uh -huh. just like a whale in the middle of the street that's like you know, dying <laughs> slowly in front of you? I mean, you're going to notice that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. It took, took it right at the dying whale. It's, it's like, like uh, I mean, for a self-driving car, for example, if you're driving on a road, 
and then I had a couple of lines in front of you. <laughs> how, do you even, how do you even prepare for something like that? But how do you hard reverse? <laughs> it's, I, would, I would not know what to do if I had a couple of lines in front of me. So yeah. in that, how do you get an algorithm what to do? Is the helicopter armed? <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent question. <laughs> At that point, there's not much I can do. Just sit there and accept it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But uh, no, that, that's what fascinates me about this session. And um, I feel like where we are now, we're just kind of scratching the surface. And I mean, it's, it's a, I'm along for the ride, guys. Yeah. I would love to work on some of these problems. And, uh, that's awesome. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really neat. Well, that's just cool. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, anything you want to plug on your way out? Uh, anything I want to plug? No. no. Uh, don't need mean comments, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do, just address them to me. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one. All right, so let's let's hear this machete story. All right, uh, you should probably also get Joel Reed to tell his side of it. <laughs> but uh, so, at uh, so I think this was my first few weeks at IM Robotics, and we had this office in Subicli, and uh, we were I was the 18th employee, so not many people, and we had a parking lot which was right next to the river, so it was kind of overgrown, and some of the weeds were starting to come in. At some point, we had to basically go out and clean it up ourselves. So, you know, there was an assortment of tools. There, was, there, there were hatchets, there were uh, other kinds of things you cut, uh, cut vegetation with. And there was also a bag of machetes. <laughs> a bag of them? A bag of machetes. <laughs> and it belonged to my colleague, Jason Geist, I believe. Jason, if it wasn't you, don't kill me. <laughs> so, so, so basically, uh, <laughs> so apparently, one of my colleagues at the time, Chris Lippert, he he took up one of those machetes, just hacking away at the vegetation, and Joel saw that, and uh, I don't exactly know what his reaction was. You should probably ask him. But yep. the next thing I know is there was a blanket ban on machetes at IM Robotics. <laughs> Which is funny to think about, and then whenever you know new people, were there just like machetes. signs with like a machete with a There was no sign, yeah. but it was it was said like machetes and flamethrowers are banned at IM Robotics. But why flamethrowers? Uh, same concept. Uh, someone was burning weeds in the <laughs> in the parking lot with flame flamethrowers, and Joel saw that too, and then he banned flamethrowers. <laughs> um, so that's one of the things I tell people when they started IM Robotics. So just so you know, machetes and flamethrowers are banned. Um, Terrible company. Can't, can't work for a place. I can't have machetes on but, but basically, yeah, if, if, you, if you're ever wondering why, basically just think of someone hacking away at vegetation with a machete in the parking lot. <laughs>